If your skin can get down in there, it does run the risk of actually getting comfortable. Using anything motorized, whether or not it's this or this, on your scrotum. Oh, so that's how you humans manscape. How frightfully amusing. Something else that, in my opinion, is a ripoff. Let's talk about some watches, all right? Omega. Good heavens. What did he just say? I better call TGV forthwith. The club within the club. The real club. This is the place full of watches. You work there? Can you get me in? No, I just work the bar upstairs. But I see him come in. You got a lot of cats. I have a thing about strays. Is that your phone? Zeria, what does he want now? Hello? That's how you greet your celebrity friends, is it? Charming. Well, every time we speak, it's either because you want me to get you out of trouble or you've stolen my Cartier watches again. Well, your Paisan Alpha M just made a rather disparaging comment about Amiga. Wait, what? I was thinking, let me do a reaction video and give him what for. It could go viral and we could get that sweet, sweet YouTube money. Split it 4060 to me as I'm the A-list star. Hugo, that sounds like very bottom of the barrel content. This isn't the Jerry Springer show. Jerry who? Never mind. I, I have to go. I, I'm very busy. Oh, dreaming about your darling Zeri again. <laughs> well, no. Listen, Hugo, I, I have to I have to go now. Okay, ciao. TGV? Hello? TGV, old oh boy. How rude. <sighs> and it comes in a selection of pieces. Okay, you won't find that so much with a plasma. <laughs> Okay, hi guys and welcome to the show. I'll start with a quick wristwatch check. Wearing the Dan Henry 1972 there. I have been having a bit of a second honeymoon with this watch, but without further ado, let's dive into the video. Now personally, maybe because of the way I was raised, I don't talk badly about other people, full stop. It's crazy to me when I hear or see people talking badly about other people on a YouTube video, especially people they have never even met or do not personally know. It's classless, ignorant, and well, kind of cowardly, pulling others down to make yourself seem better. It reeks of insecurity. Resorting to that kind of sensationalist content is the lowest form of YouTube. And unfortunately, in today's world of short attention spans and increasingly narcissistic self-entitlement, YouTube is full of uncouth, self-anointed expert watch dealers screaming like puerile children at others to ride celebrity coattails and to get attention. So Aaron Marino is not somebody I would consider a close friend, but he is definitely somebody I know. We have had telephone conversations, email exchanges, and uh, you know, back and forth in comments. He's always a good sport and deeply, deeply uh, inspirational to me. But I will never forget how much he helped me in the early days of my channel. A lot of people out there might not know, but um, he actually uh, helped me kind of get the ball rolling because I did a couple of videos talking about watches for his website. I think it was alphaM.com. It was a long time ago, it was about eight 
years ago now. And obviously it helped my channel grow. So I am forever in his debt and I will never forget that. If you look past his clickbait thumbnails, at the heart of it, he is undoubtedly a good person trying to help. Deeply motivational and a true self-made entrepreneur that was a pioneer on this strange new world we know as YouTube. In many ways, he inspired me nine years ago to pursue making more videos. This was back when mixing lifestyle with watch content on YouTube was, well, simply unheard of. How times have changed. Now, do I agree with everything he does or recommends? No. I like to think of myself adult enough to respect the differences of opinion without getting upset or offended. Unfortunately, not everyone has that capacity, especially in this overly sensitive online age where negative content always gets more viewership. So a few weeks ago, actually, it's more than that, probably if a month or two ago now, he did a video on top 10 brands he considered a ripoff. It's funny, a lot of the brands in there, I actually agree with him, except for when he said this. Something else that in my opinion is a ripoff, let's talk about some watches, all right? Omega. I personally do not feel that Omega watches are worth the price that they're charging. So what did he mean by this? What is it about Omega that makes him feel it's not worth the asking price? Well, to understand that, we have to really understand his stance on watches in general. The watch world lost its mind and tried to cancel Aaron when he made a statement about a fashion watch brand being better than Rolex. I thought it was just hilarious and saw it for what it was, an inflammatory statement to get attention, and it worked. Now, I didn't personally react at the time, like everyone else, only Hugo Mountbatten did, because I understood what he was doing. Now, would I ever wear a Henley-style shirt that he loves so much? No, absolutely not. I like it. Thank you. I've never worn an undergarment in public before. No. <laughs> but I'm not going to cancel him because he loves them, nor am I going to attack him for it. That is his style. It works on him and not on me. As grown-ups, we should be able to respectfully have different tastes and opinions and not be rude about it. After all, it would be really boring if we all loved the same thing and we never disagreed. But at the same time, there's always going to be that element of the keyboard warriors, completely anonymous in their parents' basements, you know. There's two ways to interpret the statement about Amiga, or any luxury brand for that matter, being a ripoff. Firstly, there is the argument that in a post-quartz digital and smartwatch world, paying exorbitant amounts of money for essentially a dated and less accurate technology is a false economy. There's a lot of truth to that, but look closely. While he makes this statement, he is wearing a solid gold Rolex Yachtmaster. You couldn't pick a watch that is the greater antithesis of an affordable quartz, digital or smart watch from the world's apex and most successful luxury brand of all time, no less. You see this watch? That watch costs more than your car. That's who I am and you're nothing. So obviously, Aaron does not believe it's a waste paying exorbitant amounts of money for a watch. Therefore, this means he intentionally singled out Amiga specifically. One of the indicators of this is if you go to buy one used or pre-owned, the price is literally like half of what you buy it in the store for. And by that logic, we must assume that any brand that does not appreciate in value must therefore be a ripoff in his opinion. So why pay more for a luxury watch when you can get a $10 Casio that is just as iconic, historically important, but crucially functions far better than the most traditional mechanical COSC certified chronometer? We all have different reasons. For some, it might be the mesmeric miracle and mastery of engineering available at different price points. This can range from the bewitching simplicity of having a micro machine ticking away on your wrist that can last lifetimes for only a few hundred bucks, or the most complex and highest artistic expression or innovative horterology levels of craftsmanship. It could be the rich history behind the watch or brand that touches some kind of nostalgic nerve, a sentimental connection to a particular age, person or place you hold dear to your heart. For others, it could be as simple as the look and style of it. 
It sounds shallow, but there's real artistry that goes into how they end up looking. To design an elegant watch, even the most rudimentary or minimalist, is difficult. Trust me, I've gone through the process many times with watches I've designed. Take the Junghans Max Bill, for example. Based on the revolutionary artist's mathematical theories, a profound difference between that and the faux imitation Bauhaus of the price-gouging fashion watch brands that have nothing to do with the legendary school or art movement. The fact that Max Bill watches are still so beloved and stylishly classic after so many decades is proof that good design and good taste endures. So for most of us, what we love in watches is completely different. For me, it varies from watch to watch. I may love one watch for completely different reasons. It might be the design, it might be the functionality, it could be a childhood memory. So what is it that Aaron likes most about watches? Now for me, Rolex has always symbolized like ultra success, right? I'm Italian, all the old mobsters were rocking like Rolex, like day dates. Adesso tutto fa senso, huh? Seven years ago, it happened. I finally was like, you know what? I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna treat myself and celebrate my success with a Rolex Milgau. Speaking of certain Italian-American subcultures, uh, <laughs> Al Pacino wore a solid gold Omega constellation as discussed on this channel in the Godfather movies. And that was very deliberate uh, because obviously back then Omega was considered better. Now for me, the only people I need to impress is myself and family. I buy for enjoyment. I do not need the validation of complete strangers in my life to feel better about myself. Having said that, that is, I guess you could say an advantage of Rolex having that really strong aspirational uh, connotation, the wealth flexing thing, the status signaling, all of that stuff. If you're into that, if that's important to you, then obviously Rolex is the better watch. For me, you know, mi frego un cazzo, ti dico la verità, okay? But uh, I can see where the advantage is and I can see the appeal, I can certainly understand it. However, I have to say in my opinion, I still think Amiga is the best value uh, Swiss luxury brand to this day in 2023. In terms of the length and breadth of what they offer. Let's start with the far older 19th century roots of Amiga. Now you can't really measure prestige, but while Rolex had barely started, Louis Brandt, the founder of Amiga, had already manufactured the world's first ever minute repeating watch. A few years later, this mastery of watchmaking enabled Brandt to invent the revolutionary Calibre 19. With the highly ingenious principle, of having entirely interchangeable parts, thus boosting the longevity and serviceability of movements indefinitely. When Rolex was just getting started with its oyster waterproof cases, Amiga created the first watch used for diving in 1932. And while not technically a professional diving watch as we know it, it started the brand's obsession with creating ever more deeper capable diving watches long before Rolex and even Blanc Pan, when they invented what is universally accepted as the first true dive watch during the 1950s. Compared to all the other Swiss watchmakers combined, Omega supplied the greatest amount of watches for the Allied forces in World War II, being critical in the war effort. Again, I've explored this many times on the channel, so have a look back. And while the moon landings are a phenomenal achievement, I actually have more of a profound respect for Amiga's efforts during the war, so beautifully immortalized on the silver screen by the movie Dunkirk, as it could have been a very different flag flying on the moon. During the 1950s, Amiga took all the experience of its battle-proven calibers and produced many generations of entirely in-house movements like my own legendary Calibre 500 in my vintage automatic Seamaster, earning a reputation as one of the top Swiss watchmakers of its day, venerated, respected, admired and desired far beyond Rolex at the time. And of course, in 1957, the trilogy was born and would revitalize, change the direction, define the brand to this very day and moon landings and James Bond and all of these things would happen in subsequent decades. This is the kind of fame and achievements that most brands would only dream of.
But on a technical level, forget the marketing hype, brand recognition, historic achievements, value, etc. Today, Amiga can make everything from a Turbion, an Annie DigiWatch, Minute Repeaters, to World Timers, and everything in between. More recently, love it or loathe it, they did a Dan Henry and changed the game yet again with their democratization of the iconic Speedmaster in collaboration with Swatch. Their Master Chronometer certification is beyond almost any other level of testing when it comes to regulating accuracy, anti-magnetism, water resistance, shock, and so on. All the enemies of traditional mechanical watches and far beyond the superlative chronometer status so proudly labeled on the dial of Aaron's substantially more expensive Yachtmaster. This is nothing new. Just have a quick butchers at the Amiga Wikipedia page and you will see a history of record-beating precision in trials spanning almost a century. So this is the Amiga Flightmaster from the early 70s. Originally came out in 1969, tweaked in 73 with some upgrades, eventually discontinued. It was not very successful. However, what it does demonstrate is some of the crazy designs. I mean, look at the variety you have to choose from within the brand of Amiga. This has been very kindly lent in by Andrew. He won Best Watch at the watch show that I hosted uh, in collaboration with Moya at Fine Jewelers in Carmel, Indiana. Amazing fun, we're definitely gonna do it again. They are an authorized dealer for Amiga. Thank you so much to Andrew for lending it in. I have discussed it briefly because of course it shares the name with the uh, Seiko uh, Flightmaster. Look at the design, look at the, the case that looks like a Darth Vader Seiko case as well. Very, very 70s, as I said, quintessentially 70s, the colors the complications designed for pilots. Ultimately, what this shows you is the kind of overlooked gems you can find within Amiga. There's so much variety, even within one line, like take the Seamaster line. I've done a video all about its evolution from little dainty dress watches to some of the deepest diving watches of all time, to military watches, to bond watches, to you name it. I struggle to think of a line from Rolex that has as much to offer a variety. Now, one of Aaron's arguments is the strong value retention, which he's completely right about when it comes to Rolex. However, most other brands in the world, I, I struggle to think of any product, uh, like, a, like clothes, cars, whatever. As soon as you drive it off the lot or put it on and take the label off, it depreciates. This is just simple economic reality, right? For most of us who buy for enjoyment, or any other aspect previously discussed, when it comes to collecting watches, poor value retention can actually be a benefit when buying used. Look at my entirely proprietary solid gold and timelessly elegant Amiga Seamaster from the undisputed independent golden age of the brand. I actually scored it for a bargain, a smidgen under 1500 bucks. Or more recently, this classically meraviglioso ultra-thin quartz Omega de Ville unisex dress watch that I bought as a gift for my wife at around $500. Both, in my opinion, have far more class and style than most Rolexes. And in case you're wondering, the strap on the de Ville is the original strap, and the one on my Seamaster is yet again those fantastic, soft, supple, suede, fluco nizza straps that I purchased from Holbens. Now, it's not Aaron's fault. Unfortunately, today, YouTube is oversaturated with watch dealers uh, pursuing, selling, talking about the same handful of brands because they're profitable. And thus, inadvertently pushing a false narrative that everything else, well, it's just a ripoff and not worth buying. These are not watch enthusiasts, but money enthusiasts. They do not care about artistry, design, history, engineering, tradition, or enjoyment. Watches are merely a tradable commodity. And I don't know about you, but I find it rather sad seeing watches treated like this. This is why, among many reasons, a watch dealer can never truly be a watch reviewer at the same time. You simply can't be both. Because once you cross that line, it becomes a business and therefore undermines any journalistic integrity. With social media now being driven by these dealers and not independent enthusiasts like myself, the emphasis is always on value beyond all else. I have said this a thousand times, while value is certainly an important aspect, 
it should not define a watch. This painting here, I bought it 10 years ago for $60,000. I could sell it today for $600. It's all a Fugazi. You know what a Fugazi is? We don't create <laughs> We don't build anything. The illusion has become real. And the more real it becomes, the more desperate they want it. It doesn't matter that Amiga can now produce a super complex tourbillon and Rolex don't. Or that technically they can make a Seamaster watch superior in every single way to the Yachtmaster on Aaron's wrist at a substantially lower price to the consumer without them having to wait on the list. Desirability and thus value ultimately take precedent over everything else. This is then exacerbated by the artificial scarcity of Rolex. Insidious social media algorithms that actively push negative narratives, clickbait or controversial content. Take the malevolent Facebook for example. When they found out that interaction increased, if a post or subject inspired conflict in the comments, they saw dollar signs in their eyes. The watch brands don't help the situation either, giving those vloggers or bloggers access to the hottest new releases first because they just so happen to have a watch store too. How convenient. It's no accident that all the watch channels I enjoy and most importantly trust, with the exception of my dear friend Mark of course, have less than 50,000 subscribers. Why is that? Well, it's because they are true enthusiasts not dealers. Not there to make money, but rather to share the love and passion for watches. This brings us back to Aaron, and he's not wrong in a lot of what he says. I myself will always love and adore uh, Rolex. I own many of them. I've discussed recently why I'm never going to buy another one, but th that's a separate story. <laughs> For people like me, Aaron, other YouTubers, I hate the term influencer, but we do have a degree of influence. And I do feel it's our responsibility to best help educate, inform the public out there. At the end of the day, buy what makes you happy. Try to be kind to each other. Try to help each other. It's imperative we try and grow this passion. We try and keep it alive in an honest, uh, independent way and uh, yeah so it's up to you guys you vote with your time uh, never forget that quite poetic isn't it anyway <laughs> don't forget to like this video especially if you want to see more free independent content like this best way to support the channel thank you so much for watching onwards and upwards and i'll catch you in the next one ciao